final reading from Gail Boss's book, All Creation Waits, goes like this. On our way to the woods, my dog veered left off the path. I've learned that following her on days I'm awake leads to revelation. She brought me to a small manger made of new wood, freshly sawed and nailed together. Made in the traditional nativity scene shape. The manger had been placed at the edge of the woods. It was empty. I suspected the four children living in the house nearby. Outdoors often, aided by their parents, they play games in the woods involving lightsabers, capes, and crowns. They are still seers. The manger appeared a week into Advent. Brittle brown leaves from the oak above blew into it and out of it. Then one day, the manger was not empty. It was filled to the brim with hay. Two days later, the hay had been dumped out onto the ground and the manger moved a few feet away. It was now half full of shelled corn. A single fox squirrel sat up in the manger, leisurely eating kernel after kernel. I found the children pulling each other through the snow on sleds. Tell me about the manger, I said. The oldest, a boy, said, it's for the deer. We like to watch them. Next, we're to put a hunk of salt. It's for all the animals, interrupted the smallest, a girl, who had her head tipped back, her mouth open, tasting snowflakes. In the fullness of time, the Christmas story says, a girl gave birth ringed by animals. She lay the baby in one of their feeding troughs where animal bodies would warm the air around the fresh born human body. Mother and child fell asleep and woke to their chuffs and shuffling hooves, their calls and the shuddering of their hives, hides. Later, sheep herders smelling of dirt, damp wool and milk crowded into the stable. Out in the wild night fields, these animal men sitting in the dark were the first to get the word. A baby had been born. They were told who would show people a way out of their small pinched lives, a way to abandon themselves to the ever-present unstoppable current of love that carries all things to radiant wholeness. To recognize him, they should look for a child at home among the animals. At the edge of the woods where children put out corn and salt and watch for them, the name and name them and speak to them, the animals wait. Will they one day find the manger empty, the child indoors? So much rushes children into dropping their capes and crowns in the leaf meal. So much clamors and flashes for their attention. As they grow, will they lose sight that lose the sight that sees light and spirit in other creatures? Or will they, despite the rush and the clamor, find irresistible the beauty quietly radiating from everything that is? To the animals, it makes all the difference. Their hope and the hope of all that breathes is that human ones abandon themselves to the one great love. For that, all creation waits. Let's pray. Father, would you guide our hearts, our minds, and our souls as we think about these readings, as we seek to learn about you and ourselves and one another and how we all relate. Lord, we thank you that you meet us in these times and in these places. We gather in Christ's name. Amen. I know some of our passages will strike us as funny or strange around Christmas. It might not be what you're expecting to hear. 
I'm guessing that many of us know the story well enough that maybe we could reflect a little bit more about what all this waiting and what all this expectation and what Christ's coming is about, since that's what we're celebrating. Richard Dahlstrom reads Paul where Paul said, Christ in you, the hope of glory. I don't know if you caught that. That was in our reading this morning. Dahlstrom says, we receive Jesus's seed. And as his life enters and unites with ours, we become those who pour out all the goodness that is Christ into our parched world. Like those kids, they're bringing much welcomed food to animals who were probably doing just fine without the kids. If the animals are like people, they would have simply said that they were busy or they were okay or they were fine. At least they thought they were until they walked up to the manger and discovered the surprise, the abundance, the sustenance, the provision that was hidden in this manger. Who would have thought they even had this need? They didn't know they needed it until they found it. In Christ, we discover what we didn't even know we needed. Or if we yearn for something more in life, maybe Christ surprises us by satisfying us. We are the food today. We're what's in the manger. We are to be Christ's body in the world. It's strange, but true and full of hope. Here's a quote about this. Somebody said this. No matter how unimportant we feel ourselves to be, we can pulsate with divine energy and have an unshatterable confidence that Christ is in action as we depend upon him. I was said by a guy named Major Ian Thomas. He lived in the aftermath of World War II, and he founded what became known as the Torchbearers Ministry. He was busy trying to provide food and safe lodging for young people who were living in a devastated Europe. And if you remember it, it was a tough time, that post-World War II era in Europe. And he didn't just want to give them food. He wanted to feed their souls. And he always made sure that he brought Bible teachings with him. He wanted to, people to discover that no matter what the landscape looked like, no matter how destroyed it was out there, they can know Christ personally. And as the God who was living with them and working in them and working through them, they could find hope in him. As they discovered this truth together, they chose the name Torchbearers for their ministry. They saw themselves as carrying the light of Christ into a world in a dark moment. It's a story, it's a way of understanding Christianity that was sort of new to me the first time I visited Cape Henry Harbor, which is a torchbearer's school. I was already an ordained minister at that point. It's a little school, and they host students for a certain number of months a year, but then they also host families in the summers. And they're really nice, and they host ministers for free for a couple of nights every year uh, just to give us a break. They practice a hospitality there, the likes of which I've never seen. It's far better than any hotel I've ever stayed in. Not that I've stayed in a whole lot of fancy hotels particularly, but Christ's welcome is somehow embedded in the place. The message they give every time you go is exactly the same. They, they couch it in different language, in different imagery, in different songs. But what they teach is Christ in me, Christ in you. It's meant to be liberating. And it was liberating for me when I was a brand new minister. I put way too much pressure on myself to sustain the church, to do everything right, to get it right, to do it well. The answer is it's not up to me. It's not up to your elders. It's not really even up to you. Jesus works in us. He works through us for the community. We are never alone in the adventure of the life of faith. And I think Gil Boss captured that. 
The story, she says, the little girl insists that the food is for all the animals. Jesus came for all the people, works in and through all the people, not just the ones we might guess. Not just the ones that look like us or dress like us or show up on Sunday morning. And so she's trying to conclude her study with hope. The hope that Christians everywhere can be empowered to live lives that involve abandoning ourselves, our selfishness, and turning towards love in such a way that all of creation can sigh a sigh of relief. What she's talking about is embracing a lifestyle that's more minimalist, a lifestyle with less consuming, less wasting, less demanding of creation. It's this lifestyle that is less destructive. It's lighter. It is life-affirming. It is loving. It is uplifting. One of my favorite writers is the Buddhist beat poet Gary Schneider, and he said, stay together, learn the flowers, go light. Empowered by God, Christians can do it. He works in us and he works through us. It's the hope of glory. Empowered by God, underground railroads get built and slaves get freed. Christ within us means leper colonies get built and maintained. It means hospitals and housing for poor people gets built. It means addiction centers get raised up and staffed and people are liberated. It means refugees get welcomed and financed and trained and language training and job training. It means marriages that are on the rocks can be saved. It means abuses can be noticed and can be fought against and often corrected. It means dignity for every individual because they are made in the image of God and God dwells in each of us. Christians have been weird about this for a long time. In Roman times, people would often abandon baby girls just outside of town because they didn't want girls, they wanted boys. It was Christians who went and picked up the girls and raised them. When pandemic struck, everybody with any ability to leave town did, except Christians who offered willingly and voluntarily to spend their time and their resources nursing the sick. That's the tradition that the founders of the Red Cross picked up on, which is such an endearing image. They will struggle and they work hard and they make sure they help everybody on all sides and they don't ask too many questions. Most modern example of this, I don't know how many people know this, the Red Cross is actually working in many of our hospitals today, finding ways to staff emergency places that we don't have the staff for, and they don't ask questions. A modern version might be this, as hard as it is for us, if you choose not to be vaccinated, we will still serve you. That's what it looks like in 2021, and that's sure what it's going to look like in 2022 to have Christ working in us. It's similar to the 1950s and 60s. Ecological issues were becoming obvious. It was becoming pretty clear to some people that there was a problem out there. And it was a Christian group that started to fight and organize. Greenpeace, you might not know, has been fighting for peacefulness on earth. They started as anti-war, anti-nuclear weapons and also doing ecological campaigning. And what people don't realize is the original meetings, the planning that happened in the kitchen over cups of coffee, it was two Quakers who saw Christ working in them and calling them to do something for creation and in the name of peace. And so Greenpeace is born. I know that much of church history is to be repented of. I get that. And yet at the same time, that doesn't mean the light of Christ has been snuffed out. Church history shows us that John was totally right when he said the light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not overcome it. The light shines in you. It shines in me. It shines in the people we love and the people we don't love. 
It's called Christ in Me, the Hope of Glory. Dahlstrom argues the entryway to the broad road is only appealing because we've lost sight of or never discovered our truer, higher calling and identity. Failing to see and embrace God's invitation to abundant life, the lights near the broad, wide open gate to the carnival of consumption and individualism look appealing enough that we're drawn in and soon find ourselves caught in a cycle of work, debt, comparison, and destructive, self-medicating comforts, all of which conspire to make life more burden than blessing. The alternative? Take up your calling to be a blessing in the world. Find your gifts. Use them freely. Abundant life. You see, because Christ lives in us, we are able to see the world through Christ's own eyes, the eyes of experience, the eyes that know the painful shortcomings of relationships, the eyes that see the devastation of illness, famine, death, the eyes that recognize the grieving elephants who've lost their matriarch because the poachers wanted the ivory. The gut-level disgust we all feel if we stand at the rim of an enormous garbage dump. Our hearts broken when we realize there's children scurrying in it, trying to make their living, picking the scraps out of the dump. Jesus knows. Someone once said, if Jesus is about giving dignity to the poor, replacing wars with eternal peace, learning to forgive and love enemies, and throwing a party for those on the margins, I'm in, but who knew it? Christ within me knew it. That's who. Christ within me and within you is attractive to the world. We are called to bless a broken world. Called to be fruitful, which means allowing the seeds of Christ's life in us to be received, nurtured, and germinated. We nurture the fruit by going to church, by meeting with Christians, by praying, by reading the Bible, by meditating, by fasting, by any of the spiritual disciplines. And then the fruit of this is not really up to us. It's timing and it's size. It's not our job. God takes care of that part. Believing that Christ's life dwells within us in union with humanity is the responsibility we have. To the extent that we can embrace that, that Christ is already at work in you, transformations happen for us and for the world around us. If I can begin to see myself as the presence of Jesus the Christ in the world, if I can take that mantle on willingly, maybe even eagerly, if we can embrace that joyful challenge and the adventure of serving the broken world in Jesus' name, things start to change. And it's not all up to us. It's thanks to Christ who came into the world in order to change it. So as we try to embrace that, as we try to embrace Christ, embrace his coming, I'm going to do one final meditation for us. We've been doing these throughout. We'll do the whole of the, the breastplate prayer this morning. I pray that it would be true for us in this season and in the coming year. That we would grow in Christ and that we would learn to notice him growing in us. So for a final time in 2021, I would invite you to plant your feet solidly on the ground. Place your hands on your bellies to feel the air coming and going. Christ with me.
Christ before me. Christ behind me. Christ in me. Christ beneath me. Christ above me. Christ on my right. Christ on my left. Christ, when I lie down. Christ, when I sit down. Christ, when I arrive. Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me. Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me. Christ in every eye that sees me. Christ in every ear that hears me. Christ within me, the hope of glory. Christ within me, the hope of glory. Christ within me, the hope of glory. Amen.